Absolutely. One of the things I love about the world of cars is the wondrous variety available to buyers, encompassing everything from the logical, the sensible and the practical. A Ford Focus, or if you want something a little nicer, a BMW 3 Series, all the way to temples of speed and power, such as the Ferrari F12, icons of beauty dedicated only to being the most lusty things on four wheels. And then of course, if you'd like something a little more hedonistic, you could buy a Bentley or a Rolls Royce. In the middle then, you've got all sorts of other stuff like a Mercedes E-Class, a BMW M5. And then somewhere in the middle, you have this, the Range Rover SVR. On paper, the daftest, the wildest, the stupidest, most pointless of all automobiles. And yet, it has been a riotous success for its maker and become really the go-to car for anybody living in an urban area, or indeed the countryside, that wants to prove you've made it. But is it actually a good car? Well, today, at long last, I'm finally getting the chance to find out. This should be interesting. Just in case you've somehow missed it, the Range Rover Sport, as you might have imagined, is an offshoot of the Range Rover family. It is marginally smaller than the full-fat range, and in this second-generation car, introduced in 2013, it was also a mechanically very close relative. Essentially, it's just a little bit shorter. Frustratingly, it's almost exactly the same width. And that is frustrating because, to be honest, the length of a Range Rover for me was rarely the issue. The width, though, is a big concern, particularly today, as London appears to have become obsessed with width restrictions. And they appear to be about that much larger than your average range. This model was in production until 2022, being facelifted in 2018. There were a variety of different engines available for the Sport, but the top of the tree was always the SVR, built by Jaguar and Land Rover's Special Vehicle Operations Department, Land Rover's answer to AMG and BMW's M. And to be quite honest, in this segment, it's actually those cars that look up to the Land Rover. Because for as long as it's been around, the Range Rover Sport SVR has been seen as pretty much the daddy. And there is really a very good reason for that. The Range Rover in of itself is easily the most lovable car in its class. And not just because the whole idea of a luxurious SUV is one that Range Rover invented, but also that they are really rather good at it. And yes, I know the cars are famed for their chronic reliability issues and a dealer network that really is rather poor and should do a lot better. But still, there is something about a Range Rover that is simply beguiling. To me, it's that sense of warmth you get when you step into one. Get into a Cayenne or anything of the sort and you're greeted with a, a very dour, very serious interior that lacks all sense of fun, or really more importantly for me, opulence. It's just functional. A Range Rover, though, is the sort of car that after a long day in the office at Canary Wharf, you slip into and you go, ah, it's a cosseting place to be. You then combine that with Land Rover's fabled commander driving position. The reason all Land and Range Rovers look roughly the same is because when you're sat in them, despite the fact they're pretty big, because that bonnet is nice and squared off, you can see it, meaning even though it's a large car, you can place it. And that makes this a much easier thing to drive than many other, sometimes smaller, SUVs. The Jaguar F-Pace, the Lexus RX, to give two particular examples. And of course then you come to stuff like this, a flood. And I know I've got absolutely no issue driving this car through it. You can press a button down here, the air suspension will raise up, but even without it, the car is absolutely fine. I've got no worries whatsoever, to be honest. Over the last couple of months, I've been thinking a lot that I really, really should have on the driveway at all times. A car a bit like this for those days when getting out of the house might be a touch tedious. There are a few things that the Sport misses over the full fat Range Rover, which I, to be honest, do miss, including the fabled split-folding tailgate. 
this has just got a normal electric one. The boot itself is still a decent enough size, though not quite as big as in the range. The rear is also still fairly decent and generous, and you'll certainly get five people in here, no complaints. You are then also missing the double folding sun visors, which in a large Range Rover would have one hidden here, so you can have a visor here and here. But to be honest, a lot of people don't use that, so I can kind of forgive it. And there's also just a few other little touches throughout the car that are missing, but really, I don't think really add up to all that much. What you do have, though, in their absence is a chassis that is designed to be a little keener, be more of a driver's car. And this is another classic Range Rover strong point. Yes, a two and a half ton SUV is a pretty poor starting point for a driver's machine. And yet somehow, Land Rover have always made it work. The steering in these cars is pretty decent, and the engine in this one is nothing short of spectacular. And really, it's that which led this car's owner, Billy, to buy it. Previously to this, he had a Jaguar F-Type V8 rear-wheel drive. Previously to that, he had a Jaguar XKR. Previously to that, he had a Ford Fiesta ST, but before that, he'd had an E90 generation BMW M3. The Fiesta he went to because the BMW was problematic, and he thought maybe that was a, a slightly silly car for a man in his early 20s to have, and the Fiesta seemed to be more sensible, but after he'd done that, he realised actually he'd kind of outgrown the Fiesta. So he went and got the XK and really liked the engine, but felt like the car was a bit more GT setup rather than the sporty car he was looking for. So he got the F-Type and then, though he enjoyed it, realised he did want something a little more practical. Though he lives in London, the city that simultaneously is the last place on earth you want to have a Range Rover and yet still buys all of them and because he doesn't need to drive to work and generally when he does it's a longer journey on a motorway to go and see family he wanted something that still had that engine and so he arrived at the Range Rover Sport SVR he didn't want something as big as a full fat Range Rover and as it happens this is actually a similar length to his XK so he knew that he could deal with it In case you're wondering, and we really do need to talk about it because it is the star of the show, what you will find under that carbon fibre bonnet is a 5-litre supercharged V8 that here in Facelift Guys makes 575 horsepower. Torque is in excess of 500 pound-foot. That's near 700 newton metres. Naturally, the car comes as standard with all-wheel drive and Land Rover's classic Terrain Select program, which you can access through this touchscreen system down here. That is quite frustrating because it's rather laggy and also these things shouldn't be on a touchscreen. If you want to change mode very quickly, you really shouldn't have to look down and then get your finger in the right place. It's all very, very daft. I think this should be proper physical buttons or a rotary selector as it used to be. I suppose the argument you could say is that if you press the big button down here right in the middle of the height modes, you will get automatic and the car will then do whatever it thinks is the most sensible. Like its bigger brother and just about everything else in the JLR lineup, this car has an eight-speed ZF automatic gearbox that when you're poodling around town in normal mode is perfectly pleasant. I have absolutely no issues with it whatsoever. Same goes for the seats. These are really quite nice. I'm disappointed they don't have cooling, they are simply heated, but uh, still very cosseting, very nice, plenty of adjustment in them. The wheel is the classically styled chunky affair that you would expect in a Range Rover, though in its defence the grip is actually thin enough, it's very nice in the hand and the controls are a little frustrating. They're not touch sensitive as you would have got in say a Mark A Golf, though they do look it, instead they're just, well, Nice to look at, a touch frustrating to use, although they can, if memory serves, pull a few different party pieces where they'll illuminate different things and you get multiple functions on each. That was certainly the case for the full fat Range Rover, so I'm going to assume it's the same here. I may be making an error, comment section, if I am, please do tell me. Your infotainment over here is then the standard modern JLR system that you know what actually is okay. Although I will say from experience of these cars, that is one of the things that does tend to go wrong. And the reason you get over it is because when you find yourself on a road such as this, these cars do something that they really shouldn't be able to.
You know when you watch those comic book movies and the villain is a sort of portly fellow, larger even than myself, and yet somehow they move like a ballerina? Well, that's what the Range Rover Sport does. The larger Range Rover has an element of it as well, but this even more so. It's really quite fascinating. It is genuinely like somebody has biggered a Golf R. Yes, it weighs near two and a half tons, but it does not care. It has so much go. And because it's supercharged, not turbocharged, you've got beautiful throttle response, meaning you can modulate that power precisely, which on a day like today, where the road conditions are very mixed, I really appreciate. Now these post-2018 cars with the fitment of a particulate filter and having to meet new regs aren't quite as vocal as their predecessors, but still, they make a pretty good noise, both outside and even in. <laughs> the gearbox does occasionally feel just a little blunted compared to some other applications. The downshifts in particular just take a little longer than I would really like. Upshifts are dealt with nicely and very swiftly. What I've always found really fascinating about these is every time I drive one, I'm reminded of just how nice and easy they are. You don't feel intimidated by it. You know it's huge. You know it's as big as a Range Rover, but it's not a problem. And then when I'm out driving in my own car, you see people coming around bends with just no concept whatsoever of where they are in the road. And I don't get that. It's the easiest big car to drive. It's fantastic. And you do this sort of thing and you go, Oh my word, it's sensational. Billy was saying to me today, he's only had the car since December and he tends to drive it either in London or on the motorway to go and visit family. He hasn't had a chance to experience it on proper roads. So once we're done, I'm gonna show him where my test route is because it just so happens to be on the way home for him. And uh, I know he is gonna message me later and tell me that he has had the best time ever because honestly, he's going to. I'm only doing the speed limit here. I'm not really going that quick. I could go faster if I want, but you do sort of get to about 60 or so and you realize that, yes, it is still two and a half tons. And if you want to take that sort of liberty, eventually you're going to pay for it. It doesn't matter though, because actually it's all rather alive. You can feel the car moving under you, but not in a disconcerting way. The traction control is all very natural. The all wheel drive system is doing its job. Everything about this car just comes together and makes sense. It's fantastic this thing you boot it you fall in love with it and that's the problem because you see that is exactly what every journalist does with these they get in it thrash the life out of it sometimes on a track sometimes in a beautiful part of Europe and they declare it brilliant because in that scenario it is however there is an underlying issue with this car for me, which is the fact that every single moment you're not on it, you're not having fun, which, let's be fair here, is going to be most of the time, this is a deeply flawed car. Even with the suspension and drive mode and everything set in comfort mode, it's still a very firm thing. Never quite crashy, but also never very far off. I did complain with the full fat Range Rover that the air suspension that has, this is a similar setup, did also feel like it couldn't quite cope with some of the sharper imperfections in the road, potholes, manhole covers and the like. This though just has an issue all the time. I've backed off now, the gearbox is in drive, the terrain control is in comfort mode and yes you can feel it just relinquish a touch of grip, a touch of firmness, but even so there's a constant jitter in this car. At lower speeds it gets even worse, around town, sub 30 mile an hour, it's just constantly fidgeting the whole time, never feels quite settled or quite right. And this is the compromise that has been made to try and make this car do the things that it can do. And the thing for me is that, though yes I think that's hilarious and great and brilliant and a laugh and all that, if I am going to buy a car like this, the reason I'm buying it is because I want to drive it when I've got people in the back, when the weather isn't all that great, it'd be a daily bus that I need to do sensible things. And the fact is that the regular full fat Range Rover, as I tested it with say the 4.4 litre diesel V8, already had plenty of go, it was already a decent drive, but it just felt a little more cosseting, a little more refined the whole time. 
there are of course other issues too and we'll start with some of the biggest that anybody will mention when it comes to buying a Range Rover. First off, its image. You mentioned Range Rover and I'll give it about 30 seconds before somebody says Premiership Footballer. And it is for that reason that Billy chose his car in a spec designed to appeal to the other Range Rover Sport demographic. Drug dealers. Black on black on black. It looks mean. It looks really, really good. I prefer these in the blue. You can have them with the carbon bonnet exposed, but that looks very, very tarty. However, this is just a touch plain. I like my lighter interiors. I'm grateful for the very large and openable panoramic sunroof because that does really add quite a bit to the car. However, it just doesn't feel as homely in here as I would like it. Now he has made one very sensible decision and this is something that he said was important to him. You can have these with a few different trim options. One of which is piano black that he didn't like because you just mark it instantly. One of which is carbon fibre which he thought was really taking the mickey in a two and a half ton car and I kind of agree with him on that one. And the other was this aluminium finish which I like. However the black and black eh, it just doesn't do it for me. But other colours are available. This is not really a big issue for me. What is, and I'm sure the other thing you may have already even mentioned in the comments, is the fact that recently these cars have acquired an unbelievable reputation for being the most nickable thing on planet Earth. You've barely locked the car and some ne'er-do-well has had away with it, particularly in cities like London. Now, shockingly, Billy is actually still able to insure this and for a not ungodly sum, around £1,500. But then he does live in a nicer bit of London and there's a few things that mean his quote is going to be a little lower than some others might. However, I personally would have great concerns about owning one of these in a large number of places. Even where I live, which historically I'm not really fussed about, a Range Rover, it's one of the few things that might actually get nicked. This is in fact so much of an issue that Billy and many other owners have gone old school with their security and he fits all sorts of 1980s style devices to it to make it a little bit less desirable to your twocker or your, you know, nick to order parts supplier. Oh, and I suppose I've mentioned that now. I mean, I said earlier that JLR dealers are useless. Well, they're useless at getting just about anything. He's had this car since December. They still haven't given him his spare key, that might be because they're just lazy and useless, that might be because they didn't have one and uh, they can't get another one. I heard recently, and this might not be true, I might be getting this horribly, horribly wrong, but that there were something like 10,000 cars awaiting parts in JLR dealerships across the country. That sounds wrong, doesn't it? Yet something in my head is telling me that it's not and that that really is the case. This is an issue, a big one. Overall reliability of these has always been an irritation, but it is relatively rare, particularly with these, with this engine, for them to actually fail to proceed. I'd trust it to get me wherever it was that I was going, even if that was at the top of a mountain. Okay, with summer biased sporty tires on, you might have an issue if you do try and take it properly off-road, but for the most part, it is going to be massively more capable than you're ever going to need of it. Oh goody, a bus is coming and I'm already in one. Ah! These are the moments I panic in cars like this. Whew. Now there is some good news here. And this is because, though these were a very expensive car when new, I think ticking over £100,000, because they've developed a reputation, well, for various different things, the prices have dropped quite a bit. And I was shocked to see that you can actually now pick up an early pre-facelift one of these for just over £30,000, going up to about 80 or so for a very late low mileage 2022 example. This one is a 2020 and I believe cost about 65 grand. And for that, I think it's a bit of a bargain. The problem is, I'd probably just rather spend half that on a more luxuriously appointed full fat Range Rover. The extra length isn't going to be an issue for me, but I would appreciate the extra luxury touches that you'd get. And there's still plenty of good engines in those, including effectively the same one as this. 
Not that, of course, this is peasanty. You've got nice stuff like the digital display here, which now is getting on a little bit. And though it's nice, clear, and easy to read, it doesn't really do all that much. You've got a heads-up display, double glazing, but nothing that makes me go, wow. But you know what? This is the sort of car that you cannot, you simply cannot judge by objective means because it doesn't make any sense when you do. Yes, it's quick. It's not as quick as a sports car. Yes, it's good in a bend. Not as good as a sports car. Yes, it's got room inside, but not as much as many other 4x4s, including its bigger brother. And it's also disgusting on fuel, whether you're having fun or not. But in much the same way as many a Maserati, there are very few cars that will get under your skin in the same way as these do. And so, like the full fat Range Rover, the Sport, in SVR guys particularly, I think, has to be maybe the number one car that I'm gonna hate to love. Because I do kinda love it. And I do hate myself for it. And oh my word, what was that? I love that too. It's stupid. Don't buy one, please. But if you do, I completely get it. <laughs> anyway, I want to say a big thank you to Billy for coming out today and as ever to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.